Now that you've heard all of the exciting ideas that will improve and enhance the educational opportunities for all of our students, you're probably wondering, so how possibly could we fund this? And so tonight we want to share with you, and I'm going to stress potential funding options. And making a presentation is Mr. Robert Gross, Dr. Robert Grossi, consultant with the district, and this work was in collaboration with our own board member, Mr. Craig Eisler. Dr. Grossi. Good evening, everybody. Um, so yes, yeah, so the natural progression of, of what you just saw and uh, obviously uh, just as major of a component as deciding what you want the project to look like is the ultimate finance plan uh, to pay for it. And um, so uh, what you're going to get, what you're going to see tonight are issues that the Board of Education needs to consider as you're making that decision. Um, it, it, it's going to start the process, the thought process, process and, then, and, then, and then through some of these issues and you're thinking of these issues, you're going to develop what you feel is the optimal plan. There's no um, uh, perfect plan. I, I mean, there, every, every, uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but every, every plan has um, different components to it. Uh, this district is uh, fortunate that it's in a position that it has options to consider to address the capital needs of the facilities. And um, so that's what we're going to try to accomplish today, to start the process of thinking what, uh, uh, what are the issues in determining how to fund this thing. So uh, the first uh, item on the agenda you've already uh, experienced, which is basically the phasing and the timing of the imagined project costs. Obviously, when the money is needed uh, is, is a major component to um, uh, where the money is going to come from. Second component of this presentation is to address uh, the questions and issues for the board to consider as you're starting to develop uh, the finance plan. Uh, then then uh, it's going to lead into some input from the board as it relates to that and then next steps as it relates to the financing plan. So the first issue, there's, there's, there's basically two issues. The first issue is the district needs to determine how much, how much fund balance they're going to use towards the project. And then the second component of this is whatever cost, what, what, what the money that's remaining when you take the total project cost minus the fund balance that's going to be used is how are you going to come up with that second component. So the first issue that the board's going to need to consider is how much fund balance reserve uh, do you want to maintain throughout the completion of the project? First three phases, uh, sequences, excuse me. And the important word in that sentence is throughout. Uh, uh, the, the plan should be developed so that whatever fund balance reserves the district wants to have, you want to make sure that that's the number that you have at, at a minimum after the, the, the first three phases are completed, not how much money you're going to spend uh, at this moment in time. So there's different areas of consideration. The, the, the pr first primary area of consideration is how will future board action impact fund balance reserves over the next five years. So for example, if the Board of Education, if the will of the Board is to not increase the tax levy to pay for operations over the next five years, that will have an impact on how much fund balance reserve is available for the capital projects. And then secondly, as major financial decisions are made that have the most impact on the budget, including collective bargaining agreements, staffing, program issues, um, the, the, the cost of those things also come into play over the next five years. And then the second major comp component of this area is, should additional fund balance, uh, fund balance reserves be maintained to prepare for possible legislative action beyond the control of the district? The board's going to need to assess um, various issues that, they, that, that may happen, primarily right now, a, a pension shift to school districts and a property tax freeze done at the state level, um, and, and kind of assess the probability of that and the possible impact of that in determining how many acorns do you want to keep saved up in case that happens. So you could, you could make sure that you could absorb those without impacting student learning in the school district. Currently the district has about $107 million unaudited on June 30th, 2018. The district spends about $7 million per month. So the district has about 15 months worth of fund balance reserves. 
the board policy targets reserves in the 25% to 75% range, which is three months worth of fund balance reserves to nine months worth of fund balance reserves. So the way this uh, chart works is that if the district, for example, uh, determined that it wanted to main bring the fund balances reserves from 15 months down to nine months, it, 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 which was keeping $65 million worth of reserves, it has about $42 million worth of fund balances that it could be applied that could be applied towards these projects. And 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 going to the minimum of 25 percent, if they wanted to uh, uh, bring their fund balance reserves down to three months worth of reserves or 22 million dollars, they would have 84 million dollars of reserves available. Uh, th this chart is a very important chart as it relates to the decision. Uh, so on the um, up on the uh, across the, the columns, there's um, and that's annual revenue growth, average annual revenue growth over the next five years, and the col the rows on the bottom is annual expenditure growth over the next five four years. So I'm going to use an example. Let's assume that the board of education makes a decision uh, to not increase um, its its tax levy over the next five years and essentially um, has zero revenue growth over the five-year period. And at the same time, let's assume because of costs going up, that your, your expenditures grow at 3% per year on average over the next five months. What that would mean is that the district would be utilizing about $39 million worth of those reserves to help pay for the deficit. So if, if the district makes a conscious decision to uh, incur a deficit, um, then in fact, part of that $107 million must be used during this five-year period to address that. So that's, that, that goes into the decision. Uh, the district's kind of in an interesting situation. You're gonna be presented the budget later on in the month. Cindy and I have been working on the budget. Uh, the, again, the numbers for June 2018 are unaudited at this point in time. Um, we're hopeful after the audit adjustments that the district will end up with a slight surplus. They're gonna be somewhere around there at the end of the fiscal year and the budget that's going to be presented is it may be a slight deficit. So, so the district essentially has a balanced budget. So if you think about it this way, if the district has a balanced budget and you can keep your revenue growth equal to your expenditure growth in perpetuity, your fund balance reserves are never touched. You'll always have a balanced budget. So when there's an imbalance, um, that's when fund balance reserves are affected. And the general rule of thumb for this district is for every 1% differential between expenditure growth and revenue growth, it's, it, it equates to about $13 million over the five-year period. So if expenses grow 1% more than revenues, your fund balance reserves will drop by about $13 million. And conversely, if your revenues grow 1% higher than your expenditures, your fund balance reserves will grow by $13 million. So obviously, this is a major driver that has to be considered at the same time you're deciding how much fund balance to use. I guess uh, just to put in context, historically we've been running uh, back through the last 10 or 15 years around 4% expense growth. And the amount we can levy in a given year is close to 2%, give or take um, um, uh, overall, just to give you some historical context of where that is. So um, obviously there are decisions which we're making trying to drive down the expense side of things. and. Um, there's decisions we've made in the, in the last year that impact the revenue side of things. And, 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 and in fact, the maximum that the district would be able to levy if, in uh, December 2018 will be 2.1 percent. That percentage is already established. And then, and then the second issue that the Board of Education should consider in determining how much fund balance reserves to utilize is. Um, is legislative action that could impact fund balance reserves over the next five years and beyond that we don't know if it's going to happen or not. But, but, but there's, there's a general theory that, um, talk, starting with pension shifts, there's a general theory that this, this, obviously the state of Illinois is having significant financial problems. And um, there are many experts and bond rating agencies that recommend that the state shift the pension burden from itself to school districts. And it hasn't been done yet. It's been talked about, but it hasn't been done. And there's a theory that um, some of the poorest school districts in the state couldn't absorb that. 
But over the last two years with the new evidence-based funding model, a lot of new money went to those school districts. So there are some that believe that, um, that they're approaching a point in time where they'll be more comfortable to do that. I'm not saying it's going to happen or not going to happen, but the Board of Education needs to just factor in to its thought process that the possibility exists that a pension shift would happen. The cost of the pension shift, um, different experts say different things, but the general rule of thumb is that it would cost about 9% of the credible earnings in the district. So if there was a pension shift and it was fully shifted, that 9%, to the school districts, it would cost Oak Forest, or Oak Park River Forest would have uh, an increase in your um, benefit expense of about $3 million per year. Now the likelihood if it does happen is that it will be phased in, but once it's max phased in, it would be about $3 million per year. So a balanced budget in and of itself becomes a $3 million deficit if that happens. So over this four year period, if it does pass and it wasn't phased in and it, and it, and it kicked in in year two, it won't kick in in year one, uh, we don't believe, that would, that would impact your fund balance reserves by $12 million. <clears throat> And then the second thing that the state um, proposed last year, it didn't pass, um, but, 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 it, but it still has a lot of uh, strength down in Springfield, is a property tax freeze. And the last, uh, th the last form of the property tax freeze was a two-year freeze. So if CPI stays at 2.1%, it's actually trending a little bit higher now, um, that would, uh, cost the district $2.8 million in potential revenue growth. So basically what would happen is even if the district wanted to raise its tax levy, um, it wouldn't be able to. So, so it would, in essence, force your major source of revenue to a zero growth, which would cost the district over the five-year period about $13 million. So, so that's the first major question. How, how comfortable are you? How far are you willing to bring fund balances down to a comfort level that you know that under any realistic scenario, you're not in a situation like I have to talk about with many other school districts I work with, where the discussions are about cutting staffing, cutting programming, and, and doing things that have adverse implications to student <coughs> learning. Um, the district's in a situation now that you never want to get yourself in that position. You put yourself in a nice spit, spot financially, you don't want to get to that point. Uh, but certainly there are some reserves available. You have to find the sweet spot that you're comfortable with um, and, and determine that amount. Then, once you determine how much fund balance reserves you, you're uh, willing to allocate towards the project, then, then the next, uh, next issue to consider is how do we come up with the rest of the money? So there's three primary areas uh, to look at. One is to utilize the district's annual capital budget. The other is to issue <laughs> bonds. Uh, and, and borrow funds to pay for it. And the other is to solicit outside sources, uh, donations and things of that sort. Do, uh, the, while, while certainly uh, it's unlikely that, uh, outs or at least generally speaking, outside funding sources don't cover major portions of projects, they certainly could be helpful in helping to uh, reduce the amount of money that uh, the other options uh, would, would need to address. This graph represents what uh, the annual capital bu project budget has been since 2013. And you can see that the district, within its budget, spends about $6 million annually on capital projects. So one of the issues that the Board of Education, or another issue that the Board of Education needs to consider is um, how much of this $6 million annual capital bu project budget can be aligned with the Imagine project. Perhaps there's, there's, some, there, there's, some, there, there's some overlap there. So for example, if, there's, if within that $6 million budget, there's $2 million that could be targeted towards the Imagine projects, over a five-year period, that's $10 million that would be used to help pay for projects. So that $10 million would close, would close the gap. In terms of borrowing options, there's four general categories. Uh, one is uh, non-referendum bonds, the district has about $40 million of capacity to do that. And traditionally, non-referendum bonds are issued in a way that future tax levies are used to retire the debt. The second um, type of bond issue, which is also a non-referendum bond issue, are life safety bonds. And those count against that same $40 million cap. 
and those funds are used to pay for any portions of the project that are deemed by the state of Illinois as significant health safety concerns for the school district. So there may be, a, there may be components of the project uh, that would be deemed uh, life safety projects and, and life safety bonds could be issued to address those costs. And the third one is a little different than the first two. This is debt certificates. So debt, debt certificates are a borrowing, like a non-referendum borrowing, you get the money up front, but rather than paying debt certificates off of the future tax levy, you pay it off with future budgets. So for example, uh, the district borrows $40 million, and this, these are just illustrative numbers, not necessarily exact numbers. But let's just say the district borrowed $40 million in debt certificates. Um, and it, it, it wouldn't extend a tax levy to pay that. It would, in essence, pledge, in this example, about $3 million a year of the annual budget to pay for uh, the loan over the next 20 years. So you borrow $40 million, you pay it off over 20 years, but then you have to carve out $3 million a year out of your budget every year to pay principal and interest on that loan. So it's a way to get that, take the future levy, future budgets and get the money up front. And then the fourth option is uh, referendum bonds. Uh, the district has about $150 million worth of uh, bonding capacity based on your equalized assessed valuation. And the questions that the, the Board of Education would need to ponder under that category is how much to request, uh, when to ask the question, obviously there's different sequences to this thing, and what projects will it cover. So, so, so the, these are the, the, the uh, components within the referendum category that the Board of Education would need to start considering as it's developing its final uh, recommended financing plan. Rob, isn't yeah. the, um, just for clarity, the 40 million is a subset of the 150, correct? Right, that's correct. So, so that's one, right. the 150 is a maximum borrowing capacity. If we borrowed non-referendum bonds, it would be, at, at its maximum, it would be 110. Yes. So, so the closing messages for the Board of Education are this. Uh, number one, the district has fund balance capacity to fund a portion of the imagined project. Two is that the level of fund balance reserves available is based on several controllable and uncontrollable factors. Um, three is the district needs to determine how to incorporate its current capital projects plan into a master facility plan. There's obviously ongoing uh, projects as it relates to the upkeep of this building. You know, the, the, the one positive of, of, of the school district, as, as I look at it, is that you have healthy fund balance reserves. But certainly one negative is that you have a facility that has major needs to it. So, so there's, there's a little bit of an offset in terms of your financial strength. Uh, addressing the, addressing those, need, uh, those, cap, those capital needs that have to be addressed and addressing the master plan, melding the two together into, into some, um, uh, some plan is something that the, the, the board needs to consider. And then the uh, fourth is, the, um, is that the sequencing, or, or, or basically the, the, the funding of this project sequences will require a mix of sources that may include the need to pursue a referendum. Uh, and then questions the board need to consider is, again, how much fund balance reserves is the Board of Education willing to commit towards the project? Is the Board of Education willing to levy at a level that will offset expected expenditure growth? Those two questions come hand in hand. How aggressively is the board willing to reprioritize the capital uh, projects budget towards the imagined projects? And at what point and for what reason is the board willing to run a referendum? So, so that's, the, that's obviously the task at hand. There, there, there's a lot of different factors that come into the final decision. Uh, there, there's no way that I, a person like me would come in and say, I recommend you do this. These are just some of the things for the Board of Education to consider as you develop how to fund and how much to fund um, the projects that you are presented with. That's, that, that, and that's essentially. Um, thank you, Rob, that was, uh, and Craig, uh, that was very um, helpful for me to kind of see the, not only the options, but um, how it deals with our kind of 
budgeting as we're moving forward and the approach we're going to uh, need to take. Um, I guess a request I would have um, as we're talking about things for November would be, you know, number three, the um, looking at the annual um, capital budget and summer construction and things like that and having a sense of which of those projects, particularly for scenario one and two, how those would, could be dovetailed to have that part of the budget um, be um, encapsulated in the imagined budget. And I'm not sure, I mean, I know we get a report on the summer budgets, but in terms of timing, I'm not sure if, if we'd be able to have that information. And I don't know who to look to. to, to. Yeah, but I just think that that would be, we've talked about that before, that, you know, if we're spending $3 million a year for upkeep and we've been presented with things that certainly show that um, some of this upkeep is turning into duct tape and, and prayer, that as we're looking to, uh, to renovate, how do we make sure that we're prioritizing where those funds should go? And that's, that's a very important component for the Board of Education to develop is, is, is you're, you're going to have two major capital things going on. One is upkeep and one is imagine and, 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 and um, putting the two together and figuring out um, how to, how to uh, incorporate the, the work and, and, and the budgets accordingly is, is, is very critical. Thank you very much for all, everybody for all the work that you're doing. My first part of my comment, I wanted to address two things that Dr. Grossi brought up. Um, in speaking of the tax levy growth versus the expense growth, to the extent that expenses are growing faster than the property tax levy and deficit spending continues, I think it's also important to keep in mind that as the fund balance spends down, there's going to be a sooner need for an operating tax ref or an operating referendum so not just the capital referendum to fund the imagine project but operating to keep running the business and then the second observation in the forms of debt that can be um, issued to pay for the imagine project while debt certificates may not be directly paid back out of property taxes and instead paid back out of the annual budget when you look at what the annual budget is, the revenue side of it is property taxes. So the bottom line, however the borrowings occur, it will hit taxpayers. Um, I'm here though because I wanted to address the strategic plan, the goal area six, which is facilities and finance action item one. Back in March, there were a couple of board meetings which addressed and discussed the creation of a new financial advisory committee with a completion date of 2017-2018. Details of how the committee should be structured were nailed down, who and the types of people that should be on it. It's my understanding that nothing has been done yet to date to reactivate or activate the new form of the finance committee. So I request that um, that be brought to closer, higher up on the, top, the list of to-dos. I understand that Todd Altenberg is gone, so I guess I have a question, if an open question, when will details outlining this committee be available to the public? Dr. Pruitt Adams, one of your comments during the presentation I found especially helpful. And that was that the, under the umbrellas of equity and health and safety, the purpose of Oak Park River Forest is to educate students. When you look at the cost projections and sort it by department, not seeing an academic subject until about the eighth department down the list, I find really sad. I find it sad for the kids who have to live in this world going forward. Whether or not they can swim, they can run a track, they can lift weights, they can dance in a good gym, they've got the rest of their lives ahead of them. And vocational training and academic subjects, to me, 
are too far down the priority list. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Peter Ryan. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I'm here tonight because um, I believe in the value of investing in this high school in multiple ways in service to current and future students and in service of ensuring that every student who attends here has the same access and opportunities for learning enrichment and success. Having attended back to school nights and walked the halls here again as a parent, I do believe OPRF currently is a very fine high school with outstanding faculty, staff, and administration. School facing challenges for sure as many are watching unfold on film. I also believe it is undeniable that the infrastructure and organization of facilities here, well rooted in and suited to the past, are in significant need of updating and in some cases replacement. Some of my friends here will interpret that as a reference to swimming pools, but they'd be missing a much larger point. What the Imagine OPRF group has delivered through interviews, exhaustive evidence-based research and study of best practices, is something District 200 and OPRF have long been criticized for not having a holistic master plan for long range and strategic planning. What Imagine has provided is a plan that addresses inequities and in access for people with physical challenges and kids who are navigating their own identities. A plan that centralizes student services and creates safe, accessible common areas. And yes, plans to create new, reorganized, or expanded spaces for learning, the arts, and physical education. These essential activities are growing and in high demand, but have inadequate spaces or functionalities. Finally, though short of giving the plan a full accounting, the Imagine Group has provided plans for adaptable spaces to help meet future educational needs. None of this means Imagine's plans are exempt from debate or criticism, but I differ greatly with those who would try to mischaracterize the dedicated work of their neighbors and fellow community members as somehow biased or favorable to certain groups claim is not only demonstrably false, it does a major disservice to those who dedicated so much time and energy to the Imagine Group's process. And I further disagree with those who would so doubt about Imagine's findings or who would dismiss them with little consideration. To me, those responses reflect a level of cynicism I do not believe is representative of our broader communities. Can we afford to implement the projects put forth in Imagine's proposals? I may be a dreamer, but I hope we can find fiscally responsible ways to implement these important recommendations. I believe OPRF is worth the investment the Imagine Group has proposed. I also believe there are many in our communities who feel the same, that we may reserve our energies for forums outside of social media or online message boards. Thank you, and thank you to the Imagine Group for your efforts. Thank you. Good evening, uh, David Yamashita, 827 Belfort. Uh, I want to thank the Imagine uh, OPRF committee for uh, all their hard work. It's uh, mostly uh, Rubik's Cube and Tetris at the same time. Uh, this community uh, think has expectations of uh, a high quality high school. Uh, this is a huge, huge issue with a facility that is in uh, sore need of uh, improvement and a cohesive plan. And I, I believe that we have reached that with all kinds of limitations that the facility itself and the property that it sits on uh, challenges you with. Uh, the board certainly has a lot of work ahead of them. Uh, I changed my comments because uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, pertinent, but um, just I want to share the quick part of it. Um, I used to run track, and track is a very inclusive um, sport on this community. The, uh, the committee found that uh, track has the most athletes of any sport on campus. Uh, I realized that the external facilities were not necessarily the priority for this, but I also fear that with the uh, expenditures that are going to be required for the uh, overall campus that a competition track on campus is probably not in the works. But think about it from the equity standpoint. If you look at the pictures in the yearbook, uh, track and field is the most diverse uh, group of students on campus. 
Uh, when one looks at the overall issue, the biggest challenge we're going to face, and people have already started to address it, is the finance. Uh, right now, the Village of Oak Park is priming the public for an expectation of decreasing tax bills by consolidating uh, various governmental uh, agencies. For better or worse, um, imagined or otherwise, uh, it may or may not result in any change in, uh, in your tax bill. Uh, basically, as a Board of Education, since education is the operative word, you have a lot of education ahead of you for this public to understand that this is doable. This is something that is necessary, and it is something that really is going to require some coordination between government bodies. The third part may be that this is the opportunity for IGOV to actually operate as an uh, intergovernmental agency that actually coordinates uh, activities, expenditures, and priorities. Uh, to my knowledge, IGOV has not had any real substantial results. I ask this board and other uh, governmental agencies in Oak Park and River Forest to take IGUP seriously, start coordinating some of your priorities and expenditures so that we can afford this within the, uh, uh, the demands that uh, taxpayers uh, are really looking for some relief. So that's my last little pitch, but I think IGUP might be the only way for us to get this thing done in a fashion that uh, might be palatable to the taxpayers. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Monica Sheehan, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. While there are many things to comment on regarding this plan, I will focus on three points. First, the cost estimate for just the first three phases of Imagine's plan is staggering, and with nearly half of the proposed $145 million earmarked for physical education wants. It makes me and many others think that the Imagine Group, the District 200 administrators, and you, the school board, are oblivious to the tax crisis in Oak Park. Overspending on PE is an unjustified expense at any time, and most especially now with the unsustainable tax burden in the village that's forcing many residents to move. Second, Imagine's plan does not include cost estimates for phases four and five of its plan. That's unacceptable. The outrageous total cost of Imagine's plan should be made public now with costs clearly listed for every line item. All of Luggett's long-term facility plans included costs for all phases. So we know it's a reasonable expectation. Third, when is D200 planning to go to referendum for operating expenses? That is something that you should make clear to voters before asking them for funding approval for any facility plan. In closing, the total price tag of Imagine's plan will far exceed a similar plan proposed by Leggett in May 2016. The school board, five of whom sit on the current board today, unanimously rejected the plan a month later based on its disruption factor and its price tag. It was the most expensive plan proposed at the time and was the subject of a recent opinion letter. It's a timely read or reread now in light of Imagine's proposed plan. And one more thing, the last major investment in the school was 20 years ago, not 50 years ago, as is commonly stated. It was the $18.5 million 1998 um, master facility plan, $28 million in current, in current dollars. Thank you. And here is the article about opinion letter. Thank you for having me. My name is Dory Bernstein. I live at 734 Gunderson in Oak Park. I, I want to say that this board has an obligation to the community and to the school to spend public funds wisely. And what I'm seeing tonight with the current long-term facility plan shows a careless process and should not move forward without an overhaul. <coughs> Good government best practices should be used for any long-term financial plan, facility plan. But I do want to thank the Imagine Work Group for their tireless effort. And I, I do really respect the work they've done, and I think it is a wonderful plan. I think what we need is a life cycle cost analysis, comparisons between various possibilities. I don't think it's ethical to vote on one without 
going through that process. This plan with five phases could potentially cost the taxpayers a quarter of a billion dollars. I don't know why there wasn't uh, more various choices when this was done. There were three choices for the community input and they were all very similar. Different colors moved around. Uh, there has been no cost comparison in the early stages. There's no data for that effect. There's no report for that. I have to wonder, did the architects that were paid to consult do this comparison or did they just advise that the more expensive option is best? Allowing the consulting architects who potentially could get the job to do the work for the entire process uh, leaves some ethical questions in my mind. I did go to an Imagine work group uh, information meeting in 2017 and I was told the work group would consist of 25 <coughs> community members. The staff were supposed to act in a consulting capacity for the community members. Somehow the staff component of the work group now consists of 25% of the work group. The work group was instructed to ignore all costs until all of their wants were put on paper. Any employee given no limits on improvements in their workplace would feel the sky is the limit. Giving the, sky, the staff the cost is no object in a group like this is, is just unethical. Good government best practices for fiscal, social, and environmental criteria should be used for all projects, but especially for projects of this magnitude. A thorough life cycle cost analysis should be completed before continuing with this project. I'm going to reference a paper, and I'll send the source to the board on the concept of life cycle analysis. The purpose of life cycle cost analysis is to estimate the overall costs of project alternatives and to select the, the design that ensures the facility will provide the lowest overall cost of ownership consistent with its quality and function. The life cycle cost analysis should be performed early in the design process while there is still a chance to refine the design to ensure a reduction in life cycle costs. The costs include initial costs, energy, water, operation, maintenance, repair, and replacement costs. Net present value is used in order to be able to add and compare cash flows that are incurred at different times during the life cycle of a project. All costs have to be made time equivalent. Hi, I'm Spencer Baker. I live at 400 North Elmwood Avenue. A little louder. Uh, can you hear me now? No, no, no. <laughs> the mic is working. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, I'm Spencer Baker, and um, I'm a mom with students in the school and another student coming up. And I'm so grateful for all the hard work that everyone has put into this plan. And I know that they did it with their time and their hearts. And I just want to thank everyone for all of that thoughtfulness. I see that. Um, the financial part is not going to be pretty, but sometimes we're just going to have to suck it up and pay for something knowing that that investment will have um, a price of pain and put on it for a long time and value that everyone will benefit from. So I don't want that to be a huge deterrent because I know it's always scary to, um, to spend money and to look at it that way. And I trust that you all will do it as responsibly as possible. So I just want to thank um, board and the imagine team. Oh, <coughs> I'm Marge Greenwald, um, and this will be brief on the Imagine plan. Um, I just have a few thoughts. In general, I'm positively impressed with this plan. The extensive work that went into it, really impressive. Um, boy, when those Oak Park committees in River Forest get together, this looks like the kind of work that's been done by major committees over the years. Um, I think putting out the effort to speak to 600 students plus faculty and parents is just amazing. And the, the real study of the physical uh, 
aspects of this school. Making this building more functional, particularly for students in the academic or social, on the academic or social margins, will affect, I think, the equity issue. Um, I don't think it's a direct connection, but I think it makes a difference to students. Their environment is really important. Um, I would personally tell you, just for me, that when the decision is made to build out, um, I, I know it is cheaper, definitely, uh, but a big box look will offend people in this community, and I am asking you to build something in sympathy with the beautiful building, at least most of it, that <laughs> you have at this point. Um, this school is a center both physically and emotionally for both Oak Park and River Forest. It plays a very important role. Finally, the massive changes envisioned here will need to be presented to the taxpayers in a manner that indicates that it will benefit all students. Thanks. Uh, my name is Paul Harding. Uh, my wife and I, we live in River Forest. We've lived in a community for 45 years. Our children are graduates of OPRF, and we know what a great school it is, and they got a lot out of it. Um, the problem that has been grappled with with the master plan, it's a very, very difficult problem. If it was easy, it would have been solved years ago. And in my opinion, as an architect, I think the Imagine Group and the architects have done a great job with the master plan in light of the difficulty of the whole thing. Um, I get a little bit concerned when I hear that we need to do all five phases. I personally don't believe that. I think that works against the idea of getting the project built because then it becomes an all or nothing situation for the community and then it's going to naturally build resistance. I think that the master plan, it could be compromised and it's not a bad thing. As architects, the majority of our clients, they have needs and wants that are twice the budget. So it's just a matter of the board, the Imagine Group, the architects, working through and coming up with reasonable compromises to develop a very nice project, but it could be scaled down and made modestly, moderately more affordable. Um, but in general, I think everybody's done a great job. Thank you. My name is Sally Gibbs, 527 Monroe. I hadn't intended to speak, but um, walking in tonight, I became um, quite emotional. Um, starting at the school in 1978, I was both uh, proud and sad tonight walking in. I have twin sophomores here, and nothing has changed since I graduated. Nothing. Someone can reference 1998, and we have to recall, what was that in 98? I mean, nothing has happened. And we can go back to the 50 years and I can tell you what was done. Um, but most of all, I want to thank the board for your prudence in acknowledging um, that a massive amount of work needed to be done without usurping any of your authority or any of your um, overall um, decision making. You allowed us to do massive study, research, fact finding, historical and future trends analysis. We undertook, as mentioned, the discussion with many, many students and faculty along with community members. 
we're here to solve a problem, um, or right or wrong. Many things have been left for multiple administrations because people are afraid to make a decision. A decision needs to be made and our students cannot be impacted by this any longer. Whether it's the pool, whether it's the tennis courts, whether it's education, they're all extremely important. For someone to say education is down on the list and that's the most important, not true. If you look at statistics, people in activities and athletics, their GPA averages are far substantially higher than anybody that are not in the PE or not in athletics and other groups. So I think that's a, 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 a improper statement. Um, this school has rich history and tradition, and I'm afraid that has been forgotten. One of the most uh, near and dear to my heart has always been the 1908 motto, those things that are best. And we don't have those things that are best any longer. And I'm not sure anybody knows what those things are. Um, I want to thank you, the board, for your time and effort. I believe it's a thankless job. Dr. Pruitt Adams, you have been a, um, I can't even think of a gracious word for your enlightenment and your care and concern and the equity, not only, it's a complete village here. We're not looking and we're not pointing fingers. We're looking at solving a problem. And it is a thankless job. But I want to look at all the people here and say, I have pictures. Have you been to the trainer's room and seen how disgusting it is? Have you walked in the boys' locker room? It's worse than the Cook County Jail. Those are my comments. I'm sorry. I want to thank everybody. And I know input from the community, as said, is extremely important as well. Thank you. I'm totally messed up with the clock. I'm seeing like we're counting down, and I see the numbers going up. So yeah, when it turns red, we're done. Sorry, we don't have the same system. Yes, please. My name is Heidi Grew. I live at 316 South Scoville. I have a daughter that graduated last year, and I have a junior and a freshman. And I really just want to echo um, all of the Mr. Ryan's very articulate comments about um, everything that is needed here. It's just so clear to many of us that the facilities need improvement. And I understand it's a huge investment. Um, I really can't thank the Imagine team enough. They have put in countless hours. There is nothing careless about the proposal that they have put together. They have looked at, I, I have complete confidence in the faculty, the community members, and the parents that are on that team that they have looked at this from all angles, from cost efficiencies, and, and, and everything, every imaginable possibility that's there. Hence the name Imagine. But anyway, so they're, they're just, um, I, I put my trust in them. It seems like there are some financial options. You know, I understand that a big chunk is going to PE because it's the piece of the building that needs the most work, and that's just the facts of the situation. So, thank you. Any other public comments? We can talk more. There's all sorts of stuff we have to talk about. Well, I'm try I've got a streak going. I'm trying to keep it going. So uh, I would like to say thank you to the Imagine team for seriously the the amount of hours that you put in. And I know we're not done yet, but it is always um, just gratitude that I want to express um, seeing you come out on this evening as well as all the hours that you put in and um, taking into consideration all of the many voices in our community. Um, and this was Dr. Pruitt Adams' vision um, to be able to listen to the board in terms of a long-term 
long-term facilities plan and have it be something that is um, a reflection of our community. And there are those that um, decided, opted out of being on this group and um, I'm grateful for all of you that stayed and put in all of this hard work. It is very much appreciated. And so now I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So no, I thought I heard a second over there. Okay, come on. Man. I'll second. It. That's, second. Your, that's your job. That's my second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you.